<coughs> so we talked about what a quadratic function was. And we talked about there are three ways to write this quadratic function. We talked about how we can write them in vertex form. We talked about intercept form. And then we talked about standard form. So remember these three forms, right? We talked about these before. You needed to do them to do the vertex homework. And you also are going to need to be familiar with these when you do the graphing assignment that you're supposed to do that we still need to do. So in that graphing assignment, we had a technique to graph the vertex form problems that was virtually identical to what we had done previously with the absolute value functions. We had a slightly different procedure for graphing intercept form and standard form functions that was maybe a little bit more involved and time consuming. Um, but the problem was we didn't have a method from transferring from one form to another. Um, we're going to be talking about that process today and probably for a few days. We'll be talking about this idea of how we move from one of these forms to another and the skills involved in needing to do that. Now some of these moving from one form to another is quite easy. In some of them it's much more involved. Um, but that's, that's kind of the goal today. So our goal is going to be how do we um, go from one form to another. That's what we're going to be trying to do. So it turns out this is possible. We can go in between these forms so we can go from vertex form to standard form and we can go from standard form to intercept form but there's no direct route to go from intercept form back to vertex form without in some way passing back through standard form is everybody okay with that idea so that this doesn't make a complete circle, but it is to go from one end to the other, you might have to pass through the middle. So our goal here today then is to figure out like what the procedure is for each one of these four spots. Like how do we actually go ahead and like complete the mathematics. So we're going to be filling in you know, a phrase or a word or something above these arrows during the course of this lesson today and probably the following day um, that gives us some instruction about how we go about doing this process. Everybody okay with that plan? Okay. So the first process we're going to worry about is just going from vertex form to standard form. So we're going to just kind of do this via example. So I'm just going to take a vertex form problem. And we're going to try to get it into standard form. Reminder again that standard form looks like y equals ax squared plus bx plus c, right? So 
what I really want to do is I'm just going to simplify down this vertex form expression. According to the order of operations, the first thing I need to do is to do, deal with this exponent. Everybody okay with that idea? Since there's nothing to do immediately in the parentheses, <clears throat> I can't do anything with x minus 3, right? So we'll move on next to exponents. Okay. So when I have something like x minus 3 in parentheses and then the squared outside of it, what does that really mean? Let me, let me ask a different question because it's I'm not sure I was clear on that previous one. What does 2 squared mean? 2 times 2. So this means x minus 3 times x minus 3. Very good. No. Times 2 is not the same thing as squaring. Which is not being times by 2. Think about 3 times 2, which is 6, but 3 squared is 9, right? So multiplying by 2 and squaring are not the same thing. That's okay? All right. So everybody okay with the what we've done to rewrite this? So now I have, if I look at this part here, I have three things being multiplied together, right? So I know from my basic algebra class, the associative property says this. Basically what it's saying is that I can take, if I have three things multiplied together, to do that multiplication, I'm just going to multiply two of them together, get an answer, and then multiply the third thing to that answer. So the way that I would choose to do this is I would multiply these two things together first. Is everybody okay with that? And we have a name for the process that we use to multiply those two things together. What is the name that we use? I heard somebody say it already. Foil, right? So foil is just an acronym that stands for first, outer, inner, last. Yeah, and it basically just describes how we're going to do this multiplication. So the first things we multiply are the x squareds. The outside things is the x and the negative 3. The inside things are the negative 3 and the x. And then the last things are the negative 3s. Okay. Sarah, you were trying to ask a question there? No. Uh -huh. Does everybody feel okay with what we did there? All right. Uh, what should we do next? By simplify, what do you mean specifically? Okay, so there's some like terms inside that parenthesis. After we've just foiled out, let's collect those together. So negative 3x and negative 3x gives me negative 6x. So the foiling is now complete, right? We foiled everything out. We collected the like terms back together again. And now let's distribute that 2 through. So we'll do that second multiplication. So that's 2x squared minus 12x plus 18. And then we're just going to add that 5 to the 8. So this is our standard form version of that vertex form equation.
Everybody okay? If I graphed each of these, what would I expect to get? The exact same thing. Okay? So we haven't done anything different. We've just changed the representation of the same function. So a little bit of aside here. So this is just like a vocab thing. So if I have something that's added or subtracted together in a parenthesis with some exponent on it, the outside, just like we did in this problem where we had x minus 3 squared, and we multiply that out, this has a very specific term that we use in mathematics. This is called expanding. So when we have two things like this, this is called a binomial expansion. When we do it with a binomial in there, the bi prefix means, what does bi mean as a prefix? Two, right? Uh, so there's two things that are added together, right? That's why we call it a binomial there. Everybody's okay with that idea? So let's look at the very specific case that we'll be dealing with in when we have vertex form. Where we add two things that are added together and then squared. So we said that we can just really treat this as a FOIL problem. Uh, yes, and the reason I'm doing it again with not numbers is because we can use this formula as a shortcut around the foiling. Right, but let me show you how I use the formula now. So if I wanted to do 2x minus 5 squared, instead of writing this out as a FOIL, I can take 2x, which is like my a, and I can take the negative 5, that's like my b, and now I can use this formula where I've just plugged in 2x for the a's, and negative 5 for the b's. So if I do that, what does 2x squared give me? Well, 2x times 2x is 4x squared. If I do 2 times 2x times negative 5, I get negative 20x. And if I do negative 5 squared, I get 25. So all this formula is doing is it's creating a little bit of a shortcut for me to be able to do one of these special case foilings in my head without having to write anything down. Yeah, so if I go back to the same problem, if I used the formula here, I'd have the 2 on the outside still, and then I'd have a squared plus 2 times x times negative 3. So 2 times x times negative 3 is negative 6x plus b squared, negative 3 squared is 9. So what it did is it allowed me to skip all of that. Yeah, of course. Christian? 
Yes. In addition, this formula is going to come up again, probably not today, but tomorrow when we do one of these other processes that's a bit more complicated than this one is. But this one should feel pretty doable, right? Even if you don't want to use the shortcut, that's fine. You can still FOIL. No big deal, right? That's not a, that's not a problem. Everybody feel okay with that? So the term that I'm going to write in then, going from vertex form to standard form, I'm going to write in the term expand. And that's going to be my reminder of how we go about doing this, is the process we're going to use is called expanding. Okay with that? What I want to look at next is this process going from intercept form to standard form. Okay with that? So that's the next spot we're going to look at. So we're going intercept to standard form. So my intercept form equation might look something like this. Reminder again, what does standard form look like? ax squared plus bx plus c. So basically here, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to multiply things out. This looks very much like the previous problem, right? If I look back to the previous problem, this basically just looks like this part of our previous problem, right? So what are we going to do here to, to get this into standard form? Gonna foil, right? So when I do the first outer, inner, and then last, I get that. Everybody okay there? When I collect my like terms, negative x plus 5x gives me positive 4x. And then if we just distribute the negative 3 through, we have this. And we're done. That's standard form. Everybody okay with that? So what would we say that we basically do here to go from intercept to standard form? Foil. Foil. Okay, good. So let's write that in that spot in our little map here. The next spot we're going to look at is going from standard form to intercept form. Scroll down to our spot here. And again, remember intercept form looks like this. So if I take an example, say x squared plus 4x 
minus 16. And I want to try to write this in intercept form. Those of you that remember talking about quadratics in your Algebra 1 class might have referred to something that looks like this using another piece of vocabulary that starts with an F. Does anybody remember that? If you have something that looks like P minus Q or X minus P times X minus Q, we refer to that as another form. It starts with an F. Yes? Of course. Does anybody remember that term that we use there? Starts with an F. I know it came up when we talked. To, yeah, well, who says that? Good job. It's Yeah, this is a factored form. Yeah, good. So what we're going to use then is we're going to use factoring. Of all the skills we talk about in first semester, this factoring skill is by and by or far and away the most important skill that you need to take away from the first semester of this course. It's a skill that we're going to expect that you're able to do quickly and effectively, not only in this course, but all future math courses. We are going to expect that you can do this process. Okay? So let's outline what this process looks like. such so first step is we need to find two numbers I'm going to refer to those numbers as M and N such that M times N is equal to A times C and M plus N is equal to B so when I say A, B, and C, what am I referring to here? I'm referring to the coefficients in our standard form equation. Everybody okay with that? What we do then is we're going to rewrite our standard form equation as ax squared plus mx plus nx plus c. We're then going to make two groups. The two groups we're going to make is we're going to group the first two terms together and the last two terms together. And we must, must have a plus sign in the middle there. If for whatever reason we had a subtraction symbol there, how could we solve that? How can we make that subtraction symbol if there's a subtraction symbol in between the mx and nx? How can we turn that into an addition symbol? Marshall? 
I wouldn't want to negate it because now you're changing the value of what we're trying to factor. But you're close. We do need to think about using a negative. Really, what is subtraction the same as? Adding a negative. So if I had minus nx, I would just write it as plus a negative nx. And then I have a plus sign in the middle. Is that okay? It's a fairly obvious fix now that you've seen that. So the next thing we're going to do, once we've made those two groups, is we're going to take a greatest common factor from each group. So the GCF is just an abbreviation for greatest common factor. And then our last step would be take a greatest common factor from the entire thing. So this is just the outline of kind of that factoring procedure. Greatest common factor. So what's the greatest common factor between 2x squared and 10x? between 2x squared and 10x. What's the greatest common factor between 2 and 10? What divides both of them? 2. What's the greatest common factor between x squared and x? x. So my greatest common factor is 2x. Everybody okay with what we mean by greatest common factor? Even if you didn't remember the vocab there, I know that there's a lot of Algebra 1 like acronyms like GCD and GCF and LCM and all that kind of blurs together probably after a couple of years. So, okay. so let's return to our example that I had written here before. So the first thing I want to do is I want to find the two numbers, m and n, that multiply to give me a times c. What is my value for a here? So x squared isn't a coefficient, that's a variable. But what number is in front of the x squared? One. Everybody okay there? And what is our value for c? Negative 16. And then I also need these two numbers to add to give me b, what's the b in this case? 4. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by just making a list of numbers that multiply to give me negative 16. So I could have 1 and negative 16, or negative 1 and positive 16, 2 and negative 8, negative 2 and positive 8, 4 and negative 4. Did I copy this problem down wrong? How did I what? So what am I, how am I getting these numbers? I'm just using the multiplication, my times tables, and thinking about the things that multiply to give me 16. That's okay. Um, and I have to make a confession here. I wrote down this wrong. This should be 6x here. 
we'd prefer to have something that's a problem that works. In this example, my apologies, let's turn that into 6x instead of 16. So we've written down now everything that multiplies to give me negative 16. Everybody satisfied with that? Do any of these things, pairs of numbers that we've listed, add to give us positive 6? Yes. Which pair? Negative 2 and positive 8. Everybody agree that that's the pair that we need? There's only ever one pair that does work. So I just got done saying that I made a mistake. That's okay. You can... Now, question, does it matter which one I pick as M or N? No. So I wrote it this way. Did you have to write it that way? No, you could have wrote the 2x first and the 8x second. That's fine. The negative 2x first and the 8x second. Anyways. All right. The next thing I need to do is make two groups, right? So here's my first group. And uh-oh, what's going to happen if I try to make my second group? I don't have an addition symbol there, right? What was the fix? I just turn that into plus a negative and go on, on about my merry way. So far, so good? Okay. If I look at the first group, if I look at 8, I'm sorry, x squared plus 8x, what is the greatest common factor between x squared and 8x? It's not one. There's more than one. 8x and x squared. I'm just looking at the first group. What's the greatest common factor there? So if I look at the coefficients, the greatest common factor between 1 and 8 is 1. Now let's look at the variable parts. What's the greatest common factor between x squared and x? x. So when I take the x out, what does the x squared turn into? x. And what does the 8x turn into? 8. Is everybody okay with what I've done there? Let's do the same thing then to the second group. What's the greatest common factor between negative 2x and negative 16? Negative 2. It's important you make negative 2 there and not just 2. So when I take negative 2 out, what does negative 2x become? x. And what does negative 16 become? Positive 8. Okay. Everybody feel so far so good? The next step says I'm going to look for the greatest common factor of the whole thing. So I'm looking at the entire thing. So if I look at 8x times x plus 8, minus 2 times x plus 8. Do we, some, do we see something in common between this piece and this piece? Uh, there's more than one. What was that? x plus 8. Everybody agree with that? That that's in common to each part? Yes? So let's. that's our greatest common factor. So when I factor the x plus 8 out, what's left is the x minus 2.
and we're done. Now that seemed like a kind of a long process there. And at times, that is the process we're going to have to use. There are times where there's a shortcut available to us. Sarah, I didn't teach you the shortcut because the shortcut does not work every single time. The shortcut is a special case in mathematics. The general trend is we start with the most general. We want the pr process that works every single time. And then we'll add in the shortcuts that allow us to streamline that process in special cases. Okay? So that, just to be clear. Okay. I know. It seems like you just showed me the long way, and now you're showing me the short way. I know. I'm just, I'm just trying to explain to you the reasoning, though. Okay. So if the leading coefficient is 1, and we can find our two numbers, m and n, and we can go straight to our answer, x plus m times x plus n. Let's just see uh, some examples of doing this. Okay. So x squared plus 7x plus 10. We want to find the two numbers that multiply to give me what? One times ten or ten. And they have to add to give me what? Seven. So we always start with the multiplication list. So what are the numbers that multiply to give me 10? Well, I have 1 and 10, and two. negative 1 and negative 10, 5 and 2, and negative 5 and negative 2. Do any of those add to give me 7? 2 and 5. So what does that allow me to do then? straight to my answer. I am only able to do that because the leading coefficient here is 1. If that were not the case, this process does not work. Okay, The shortcut only works when that leading coefficient is 1. Let's do some more. What if I have x squared minus 7x plus 6? We're done writing things down now. You've seen me write them down. We're doing these in our head. This is the process we'd like to get to, to where you can do these in your head almost instantaneously. What are the two numbers I have to multiply to give me? They have to multiply to give me 6. What do they add to give me? Negative 7. What are those two numbers? Negative 1 and negative 6. Right? Everybody agree that, that those two numbers work? Okay. 
about x squared plus x minus 56. What does this factor to? Negative 7 and positive 8 are the two numbers at work, so we can write x minus 7 times x plus 8. other prior learning is becoming apparent that was pretty important to be able to do this effectively. You would have done this in elementary school. Your times tables, right? If you don't know like what, if you don't aren't familiar with your multiplication tables, this becomes a lot harder than it really needs to be. And I'm sure in elementary school you thought to yourself, why am I memorizing all this crap? Why can't I just use my calculator? This is why. Because those num basic number sense become really important. And we don't want to be able to just go forwards. You'd want to be able to go backwards too, like remembering the two numbers that multiply to give you. Let's do another. Close, farther away, negative 10 and positive 9. So again, trying to figure out the things that multiply to give us C, while also adding to give us B. Right? So always start with the multiplication problem first and work to the addition problem last. The reason we want to do that is how many pairs of integers are going to multiply to give us a number? It's finite, right? That's a list that ends. How many pairs of numbers like add to give us negative 1? Infinite, right? So always start with the multiplication problem because your list is going to end. Your list of addition answers never ends. Don't start with addition. For example, numbers that add to give me negative 1. 0, negative 1. Negative 2, positive 1. Negative 3, positive 2. Negative 4, positive 3. And I can go continue this list forever. It never ends. Don't start with the addition problem. Multiplication problem starts the process, okay? Let's keep going. Like I said, this is the fundamentally most important skill from semester one. If you cannot do this, it is going to be problems the entire year. Got to be able to do this process. Let's practice some more. Very good. X plus 5 times X plus 3. Good. Good. Does it matter what order I write these pairs of parentheses? No, I could write x plus 7 first and x minus 9 last. That's fine. Why is it okay to change the orders like that? 
Right, because multiplication is commutative. You can do A times B is the same as B times A. At least for real numbers, that's not always the case. We'll look at a situation later on this semester where multiplication isn't commutative. Whoa, scary. G, H, I think, comes next. Sierra? No, you say it out loud. I demand you do it. Negative 2 times positive 2 gives me negative 4. Negative 2 plus positive 2 gives me 0. Notice that there is no regular x term in the middle. That b value is 0. This has a special name. It's called a difference of 2 squares. So I have something squared minus something squared. And the nice part about the difference of two squares is that there is a nice, easy factoring pattern that we can apply. Is everybody okay with that idea? Um, we'll stop here. I know we still have some minutes.